Hello, I'm your host, Alex Freebring, and this is The Alex Analyst Show. Thank you so much for joining me. Today, I am bringing on a very special guest. It is John over at How to Get an Analytics Job on YouTube. I am interviewing him on some really good topics, and those topics include things like starting an analytics com consulting company, how he got clients, how he networked, his pricing. Uh, we also talk about doing freelancing on Fiverr and Upwork, and a little bit about the tools that he uses as uh, you know an analytics professional doing consulting business as well as running his own business. And so is a very good interview in my opinion, and I hope you enjoy it. Without further ado, let's get right into the interview. I just wanna kind of get an introduction of kind of who you are. So why don't you share a little bit about yourself um, and then we'll start going from there. Of course. Well, first of all, thank you for having me on. So absolutely, this is a great opportunity to kind of reach your audience. And it sounds like they've got some questions about consulting. So super yep. excited to talk about that. So a quick little rundown of who I am. So my name is John David, and I'm the founder of a consulting agency called Silvertone Analytics. I also have nine courses published online, and I also teach um, at High Point University and Greensboro College. I teach Excel at High Point University and a case studies in business analytics at Greensboro College, which is kind of cool because I get to combine my students with my consulting clients and they get to work on actual real projects. I think that pretty much sums it up. Awesome. Yeah, and and you know your YouTube channel is very good and you're always bringing on guests. And I was a guest of yours. That's you true. Know, what was it like three, four months ago? It's one of the best like, performing what? videos. <laughs> What's that? It's one of the best performing videos. So the <laughs> zero to 100,000 people love right. that topic. <laughs> right. Yeah, I mean, who doesn't love a good success story, really? Um, and and that was, um, I had a lot of fun making that. I had always planned to bring you on. <clears throat> it's just our schedules are so different. So right. super honored um, to have you on here. I'm going to get started with the questions if, um, if that's all right. Absolutely. Um, so the very first question um, I want to ask is, you know, how did you get into analytics? You know, was that always your plan or it just kind of happened? Um, you know, because I think a lot of people start in other careers and then somehow find their way into analytics. Um, and so I'd love to hear a little bit more about, about how you actually got into this field. So I guess, let me start this kind of topic or conversation around, I think around 25, there was like an existential crisis that I had. <laughs> so I, I started undergrad and I was kind of like in this daydream of like being really immature and I didn't work very hard and I wasn't very focused. Then I got out of undergrad and I worked and I sold insurance 100% commission door to door oh, for man. three years. And that just, that was a come to Jesus moment, so to speak. <laughs> I was just like, I am miserable. I was living at home. I was making hardly any money. Uh -huh. Then I finally landed like my white whale of a client. And then overnight they just went with another provider. So right. that was, man, that was like six years ago. And then what I did was I took three months off because I had some passive revenue coming in from the insurance I had sold already. And I started doing some analysis and I found out that analytics, analytics, data, you know, data science, all of that was just this hugely emerging space. It's the future. And it, ha and it just so happened that two blocks away from where I was living at the time, uh, UNCG had just started an MBA with a concentration in analytics. Mm. So then I applied, got accepted, and then I had two years to kind of kind of turn my whole life around. So you kind of took a big leap forward or kind of a shot in the dark almost because it was a new program and you didn't really have an analytics background, but you still went for the master's. Uh, you, you still went for the master's, even though you weren't sure if that was for you, I guess. Well, I knew that I needed to develop a skill and I probably could have done that much cheaper if I would have done kind of like the online learning route, but that's, it's kind of risky because, you know, you might find a course that is not very good. You also don't have the mentorship or the community aspect that you do at the university setting. Right. So I, I would say the MBA basically gave me the space to kind of collect myself and then the time and the energy to focus on, on building a skill. So that was kind of how I, I turned that out. And I would say the most valuable experience that I had during that MBA was I had three internships, wow. two of which were flaming dumpster fires, <laughs> which I'm actually that those are the most, probably the two most valuable experiences I had during my master's program, because it gave me very quick feedback. So these were three month, you know, work projects 
that I realize I hate this. I can't work uh-huh. this. I don't like this person. I don't like this company culture. I don't like working for a big company. Right. So that gave me a lot of feedback to where that last semester, I actually went with a much smaller company. So I went, I was interning at a $12 billion company and then I actually applied for a much smaller company. And even, <laughs> this is kind of wild. They were looking for someone who didn't have very much experience or skills. <laughs> Basically, I was an MBA applying for like a sophomore or junior level position in undergrad. Right. But what I did was I showed up with that, to that interview saying, hey, look, you need to do a line review. I can implement Tableau and we can scale this to your entire company. Mm-hmm. So within that last three months, I built out the... Um, analytics infrastructure for my first client. So I turned that internship into my first client. And wow. this, that was four years ago. And I'm still managing that, that system today. That's awesome. So, you know, I've talked about kind of a big company versus a small company. Based on your story, are you saying you would recommend a smaller company to get started? Was, was it more beneficial? I think that I, you have to is probably really valuable to you because you have three kids and you have a wife that just seems existentially just boring to me. Like I, like I, I want new novel things. So like working as an analyst in one of these big companies, you kind of be doing the same thing for a number of years. I mean, you might have some fires to put out here and there, but like you're pretty set to where with this smaller company, I was working directly with the president of the company And I got to define and carve out the work that I wanted to do. So I basically had influence over the decision maker. Yeah, no, I totally get that. Um, And I had a very similar experience and and I I completely agree with you. I think you have a little bit more, a little bit more influence, a little bit more say uh, in things. And it's, uh, it it can be definitely be a good feeling. And you learn a ton at small companies because uh, they give you a lot more tasks and a lot more, um, uh, a lot more leeway on the kind of work you do. It's not as set and narrow. Mm -hmm. It's kind of a little bit more broad. So that is awesome. Um, And you mentioned that you had a a unit, an MBA. It sounds like you had a very interesting experience with the internships. Um, You know, something that a lot of people ask me is, you know, what kind of degree should I get? Should I go get a master's degree? Do I need a master's degree? Uh, In your experience, would you say that your MBA was extremely beneficial or do you kind of wish you had gone a different route with your education? Mm, that's a really tough call because I feel like the classes I took on analytics did not really provide me any skills. Like mm-hmm. I did not come out of those, I, I think I took four or five like uh, topics or classes on analytics or kind of data science And it's taught by an academic who's n- far removed from the field and what they're teaching might be like 20 to 30 years outdated. So right. like, I, I don't think that in terms of hard skills, that really was a home run. Mm-hmm. Although that being said, I did learn the business vernacular. I learned about, you know, I mean, the MBA program, we, we focused on marketing and technology and supply chain and all the various different. So it was a good education. Um, and I went to UNCG. So it was um, relatively cheap. It was a $24,000 MBA. Mm -hmm. So I I don't have that name brand recognition of like a Harvard or Stanford. That being said, if you're going the consulting route, you don't really need an MBA. I I don't think a client has ever asked me where I went to school or even if I had it, they're just concerned. Can you do this or can you not? Right. So my portfolio speaks volumes, volumes, volumes louder than any accolade. That Mm -hmm. being said, if you want to go the big company route, I think it does matter. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I definitely, um, can understand that viewpoint. I think the larger companies definitely look at the education um, a little bit closer because they want mm-hmm. people who kind of as have those proven smarts. Uh, you know, they have right. the, the education from the name brand school, and so that's you know extremely interesting. And and pulling that into your business, you now own your own business, your own consulting company. I would mm-hmm. love um, if you would <laughs> go a little bit more into that. Um, you know, you started it yourself. You you run it um, and, and you bring in your own clients, which just seems, you know, is very different than a traditional, what I would consider a tr- traditional data analyst job. But I know that there's a yeah. large uh, demand, not, maybe not as much demand, but um, there's a lot of people wanting to do what you're doing and they want to know right. how to get into that business um, and, and everything that pertains to that. So could you walk through a little bit about 
your consulting business, kind of how you started it, how you get clients and the kind of work that you do with your clients. Okay. So the way that I started it, well, I kind of gave you the highlight reel. Uh, I turned my last internship into my first consulting client and I've been paid on retainer since then for the past four years. So I at least have a base level of income, which is, it's mm-hmm. not a, a lot. And I, this could be a whole another topic too of, I started as an intern and now I'm negotiating up from like $10 an hour. Right. So like going from 10 to where I charge 175 an hour now, Right. I, for that specific client, I do not charge nearly that rate. It's hard, it's hard to make that leap. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, so yeah, I, I started with that one client and for about two months, I worked from my kitchen, got super lonely. And then I moved to a co-working space in downtown Greensboro. Mm-hmm. And I worked there probably for three to six months. And what the benefit of working at one of these co-working spaces is that I was surrounded by entrepreneurs. Mm-hmm. And I was also the only person that was kind of an analytics ex- expert. Although at that time I was like, not... I didn't even know what ETL was, you know, Uh I was like very green, but I had the sales skills to like kind of convince people. Um, What happened after maybe three to six months of working there, I ran into a guy who was a fractional CXO. Do you know what that means? No. So Gary Fly was a former business partner. He's actually now one of my clients. It's funny, that relationship didn't pay out until like our partnership dissolved and then he took over the presidency of a pretty large company in Greensboro. And now I'm consulting for them. Um, so uh, CXO is, he's basically hired as a C-suite executive. So either CMO, CEO, um, C, anything but CFO. So he's not a finance guy. So mm-hmm. he'll come in if a company's struggling and basically you can kind of think of it like flipping a house. Like you, you buy a foreclosed house, fix it up and then sell it. So he would be kind of the person fixing up the company and then he would come out. Interesting. Okay. So that one relationship opened up my network, like an incredible amount. Mm -hmm. And what actually happened was him, he introduced me to Ryan Forrest, who's one of my closest friends. And he's actually like a, we do a lot of work together. He, he runs this marketing agency called Fungi Marketing. The three of us actually, um, rolled up an LLP, so Limited Liability Partnership. And mm-hmm. for about two years, we were kind of sourcing just that network and coming in and bringing clients. So the number one way that I find clients is through referrals, just through right. being known as the analytics expert in Greensboro, which mm-hmm. I mean, it's 350,000 people, I think, in Greensboro. So it's I'm kind of a big fish in a little pond. Right. So that would be the number one way. Yeah. So you would say you would say you kind of found a niche in your area. Exactly. Um, and you it's mostly networking, it sounds like. Um, I also got into public speaking. So okay. there was a um, nonprofit before COVID hit that was um, they were doing these Thursday gatherings. So it was called Venture Cafe. And you would come in and talk about a specific topic. And I and I would I went maybe I started going there every week just to kind of network, but then I started getting into talking about analytics and different aspects. And then I would bring clients in that way. And I also started getting, got into kind of doing seminars as well. Mm -hmm. So within my coworking space, one of their revenue models that they kind of experimented with in was having the experts that were there do like hour long seminars on their area of expertise. And it turns out that the CFO of, of a relatively large waste disposal company showed up to my seminar to learn Tableau mm-hmm. and then went home, tried to implement some of the things. was like, I don't have time for this. I'm just going to hire him. Right. So now I've, I've worked with that client for probably a year, year and a half now. That's awesome. So it really is, I mean, just kind of putting yourself out there, going to events, yeah. networking, getting to know people. And then, you know, it may not pay off immediately, but it did pay off. Um, I guess for, because my question is, because if I were to start doing this today, if I were to, you know, say, hey, I'm going to start to competing company against you, call it, you know, Alex <laughs> Good luck. Analytics or whatever it is, it, it is the exact same business, right? I, and I'm trying to get, you know, I come to your area, I'm, I'm trying to get your clients. I would find it extremely hard to enter that market. I couldn't imagine how I would enter that market without knowing people. How would I go right. about meeting people like that? I mean, yours was a little bit different. It, it was a different time. You know, you had the, that you, you kind of put yourself out with, with seminars and with all these things. You know, I'm a nobody. Nobody wants to hear Alex talk. They, you know, I might meet him on like LinkedIn or something. Is you know, how would I go about meeting people to grow a business in consulting? 
Oh man, that's a tough question, especially right now. Yeah. So like now there's like this new online conference thing, which I think is a really strange concept. <laughs> um, one way that you might actually want to try to approach this. So you're thinking of it kind of like getting established in a local smaller market. Right. I think that may not be the right approach. Okay. Um, I think that, so, so Ryan Forrest actually just mentioned he's the CFO or CMO of that company. Um, or runs his own marketing agency. He is now starting his own YouTube channel talking about his area of expertise. So I think that concept of teaching, you got to figure out, okay, what's my niche? So he's, his thing is using Google Analytics to drive more sales. Mm -hmm. So what he did was he kind of empathized with his client or his potential client that he might bring in through YouTube, kind of come up with a list, run them through like um, TubeBuddy or some type of um, SEO tool to figure out, are people actually searching for this? Right. and then put the content out there. So basically mm -hmm. it's, you, you would get them, teach them the basics, then they'd realize, oh, this is much more complex than I wanted or thought it was. Right. I don't wanna do this. I'm just gonna hire this person who's taught me right. these skills. Right. So I think that's one strategy to really get yourself established. Right. Um, Cause I, I don't know if I have any good advice of like, now that we're in lockdown, like how do you organically meet people? I don't know right. if that, that, you know, maybe in a year and a half or whenever, right. you know, 2050, I, whenever this stops. <laughs> and it almost sounds to me like, in, in, it almost sounds to me like instead of the traditional networking, you're almost becoming somewhat of a teacher, someone who people can trust. And then when they come to you, then you're like, hey, you know, I have right. this, I can work for you, I can help you with this, or just being through teaching them, they might want you to work for them. Instead of the traditional going in person, shaking hands, um, you know, all that stuff that typically goes along with networking. Right. It's like bringing it back to kind of the sales marketing thing. It's the difference between cold calling and cold outreach. Of like, hey, you've never met me, but I want to charge 175 to fix your analytics. And they're going to be like, right. who are you? Versus, <laughs> oh, here, I can help you. I can help you with this one aspect. Right. And then they come in and if they get value out of it, you've kind of created some goodwill. Right. And I mean, I don't want to sound overly Machiavellian, but if you build up enough of that goodwill, you can eventually, eventually cash in on it. Right. Well, you know, I mean, you have to make a living somehow. <laughs> I don't right, think right. Any, no <laughs> one's, no one's uh, sitting at home, you know, listening to this and being like, man, that guy's over here trying to make money. I don't like it. Everyone, you know, we were, you got to respect the grind that, you know, yeah. you are putting a lot of time and upfront time because you could mm -hmm. be doing all these trainings and nobody could buy your services and you are just helping people. And in the end, you know, Sometimes that's all you get out of it. And maybe later on down the road, somebody signs up or, or wants your services. So, you know, right. it's not always a guaranteed thing. Um, and that's actually, that is one aspect that I was kind of interested in because I have a paycheck. I get a paycheck every two mm -hmm. weeks, right? Um, and I have a budget based around that, that paycheck. It's very consistent. And I know exactly what I'm going to make, Right. How are yeah. those paychecks different? Um, oh. You know, how, how is the salary coming in different than when you have a traditional nine to five job? Oh, it's extremely volatile. But I will say this, because I, I think kind of, you're talking about the paycheck, but what I'm kind of hearing underneath the surface there is this concept of security. So income security. Right. right. So I would say that on the front end, if you're, if you're kind of at, Point one, I want my next opportunity. You could go the employee route and you have mm -hmm. that guarantee. But that being said, you leave a lot of earning potential on the, on the table. Mm -hmm. You could go the consulting route, which is very high risk on the front end, but you can make a multiple more if you can get kind of that critical mass developed to where kind of what I, what I tell people is, it's, it's kind of flip-flopped. Short term, I would say being an employee is a secure bet. Mm -hmm. but that being said, you have one revenue source. So if your job goes out of, or if your business goes out of, um, out of work, or it's like you, if, if it goes right. under, that's right. gone to right. where, where I'm at now, I have probably six different revenues, like pretty solid revenue sources. So if I lose one of those clients, which that actually happened with COVID, I lost two pretty solid consulting engagements. Mm -hmm. That being said, like I'm actually making more money now than I was before the lockdown because right. my online course sales have just skyrocketed. I've had 160,000 people take my courses so far this year. Wow. So that, that has been a massive, just I'd say multiplier there. Mm -hmm. So 
you kind of get to a point where you have, it's almost like being polyamorous too. Like you have multiple people who have paid you money. It's like right. being monogamous versus polyamorous. Right. Where like those relationships might have, might come back to where like that CFO from that company had that project. And then six months down the road, they're going to say, oh, well, we actually could mine this data or do or visualize this. So as the years go on, you have a growing pool of people who, who you've done good work for, you've executed, they trust you, and they've already spent money on you. I think that's a pretty big one too. Mm-hmm. So like just getting someone to already say yes, it's easier to get them to say yes again. Right. But it's, you're kind of like building the stable of potential revenue sources. So right. now it's funny because like I have, I have more consulting work than I can realistically get to right now. Mm-hmm. Cause I'm teaching two courses and running the podcast, um, which is, it's interesting to see because I'm, what I'm stressed about is that I, I don't want to say no, because I don't want to hurt that relationship because it, it might lead to even more work. Yeah. And that's everything you said is just gold. I mean, it, <laughs> I, I try, I try to think about that. Cause you know, I thought about it. I'm like, you know, I'm a smart guy. I could go into consulting. I just, I don't know where to go. I don't know what to do, but I could figure it out. Right. But realistically, I mean, you and I are, we're different because I have a family Mm. of three. I have, I have response. I, you know, I have not, not that you don't have responsibilities. I have obligations to my family and I can't, I don't really have the opportunity right now financially to take a risk, Mm. especially during, you know, COVID and everything that's going on. Um, And so, you know, to me, Consulting would be very scary and very scary for my family. I think that that level of um, unknown with that paycheck, like you were saying, that sense of security would be very big for me. Um, you know, I do you, you know, you don't have to talk about it, but do you have a family? <laughs> do you have a girlfriend? Do you have something that, you know, that you would kind of compare with my three kids? Um or are you kind of like more on your own where you have the time to to do all the consulting and all these other revenue streams as you said i would say i'm aggressively single right now <laughs> aggressively now now when you say aggressively single what does that mean i, I gotta know <laughs> um you know i was talking with my friend about uh this of like you know how you get into a new relationship you kind of have like this honeymoon phase yes yep. i feel that way towards like my business right now which i don't know if that's healthy or weird but like now i've just monetized on youtube i just got a sponsorship deal and i'm like i've created this this life for myself right and it's like very fulfilling i feel like also the teaching is actually really meaningful because i i get to like actually impact young people's lives and like yeah for sure it's like ego fulfillment of like i'm the professor i'm smart listen to me (laughs) i'm molding you but right i'm i'm in a really good place to where like i don't know if i have time or bandwidth for another like a like a serious committed relationship right to where like, I mean, I, I do date casually, but like, I'm not looking currently for like, you know, I actually had to turn a girl down recently on, that I met on Bumble who was looking for like, well, I want to have kids soon or I want, I want a commitment. <laughs> well, like, hey, well, I slow down. <laughs> hey, look, I'm bringing in a lot of money right now. If they... <laughs> <laughs> right, right. So that, that's, that's where I'm at. And I, and I realized that, well, I'm 31. So like if um, I may have kids a little bit later, if I do decide to go down that route, um, which are the pro- pros and cons to that. But you're right. I am privileged in a certain aspect based on the past decisions I've made. Cause mm-hmm. like I was editing videos until like 10 PM on Saturday night, you know, like I, I maybe should have a little bit better of a work-life balance, but I feel like I'm just, there's so much opportunity on the table. I feel like I owe my past self like, look, you've sacrificed for four years now, like right. barely holding on. And now there's all this opportunity coming into your life. Can't you owe it to yourself to make sure that you capitalize on it. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, and, and I think that is a really good, um, a really good way to put it because, uh, you know, I know what it's like to be flat broke and, and it's hard mm. for me to turn down things too. Um, and so, you know, I could imagine, you know, once you start going down that path, there will be things that you have to sacrifice in order to make a relationship, kids, et cetera, work. Um, and so, you know, I totally get that. And it definitely sounds like if somebody wants to get into this field, they really need to consider, you know, do they want to go, if they want to do the consulting, do they have, do they have family? Do they have responsibilities? Um, you know, do they have kids? Things like that before they start 
really diving into it because it is a large time commitment up front, I'm sure. Okay. I do want to caveat this though. So if you already are working in, so the, the traditional advice is that I should not have started my consulting agency, essentially knowing nothing and having no, like having three experiences as an intern, like <laughs> you shouldn't know that's, and I, I, I'm like lucky and then I'm hard headed enough to not listen to people when they're telling me what to do, mm-hmm. which is also, I'm unlucky because I don't listen when people tell me what to do sometimes. <laughs> um, I think that if you are maybe 10 years into your career as an analyst and you have a lot of people in your network who could be potential clients Mm -hmm. and you have a kid and you have a family and you, I think this is the kicker though. If you have capital, if you have money to invest in building a website and building out a maybe hire a marketing person, building out a marketing campaign, you, the, I essentially what I put in over the past three to four years was sweat equity. Mm -hmm. So I was, yeah, had zero income stability. Uh, I mean, I I did actually go further into debt. You know, I I don't think American Express is the best creditor to take out (laughs) loans. But I, I, well, that being said, I've I've paid down like a massive chunk of it over the past few months. Um, So it's it's paid off. But if you have if you have some like money stashed away that you can invest, you could approach this from a much I guess, less all in. I basically, what I did was I burned the bridges. Like, I don't know what general that was, but you know, they, they got their army to the, the other continent and they burned all their bridges. So they had no option to go back. So I just pushed forward and it was a huge gamble. And it's, I mean, it's, it's paid off. Like I'm, 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 I'm here now. Um, You know, I mean, definitely like, you know, I could be like where you're at, where I have, you know, a family and kids and stuff, but I think that I'm pretty happy and I feel pretty fulfilled right now. Yeah. Um, so I, I think it paid off, but yeah, I don't want, I don't want the audience to get the takeaway that you have to be single and you have to be like insanely <laughs> driven to start consulting. Cause I don't think that's yeah. true. You can actually kind of split it too. Like you could start um, actually, I know somebody who works for a major bank that was one of the founding, I guess, architects of their analytics infrastructure he scaled back to working two days a week and consulting three. Mm-hmm. So there, there are other paths. I cannot tell you what that that's like, cause that's not like my lived personal experience. Right. I don't know viscerally like what that entails. Cause yeah. I've, it's funny that my, my podcast is how to get an English shop. I've, I've never had one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, that's, a, I'm glad you said that because I was not trying to say you have to choose kids and a family right. or consulting. I wasn't trying to say that, but I'm glad you said it. Cause I could listening to myself play that back. I may have alluded to that. I was not trying to mean that. But yeah, that's that's a great point. Um, and something you mentioned a little bit earlier was work-life balance. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, my work-life balance is I don't have one because I'm, I stay up till about 1 a.m. every night doing work uh, that I should have done during the day. And I wake up at six o'clock to help with the kids. I mean, it's, it's, com- it's terrible, but it's, it's more family integrated with my work because of COVID and everything that's going on. So it's a little bit different because, but you're in a different situation. You know, you're mostly business focused. How does your work-life balance work with just the business side of things and, and everything that you do? Um, I will say this. I am very, very unbalanced right now. And I'm, cause I'm probably going on three or four weeks of working like seven, seven days a week. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I, part of that is, this is my, it's, it's funny. Cause like right now I'm, I'm in a position where I don't have to work. So my, uh-huh. my passive revenue sources from, um, all my courses. So I have nine courses across LinkedIn, Linda and Udemy. I have, I've had 160,000 people sign up, so I don't really have to work right now. Right. But what's weird is that now I'm working harder than ever because it's like, well, I had a sponsorship come out. Yeah. I, you know, we just monetize. Let's, let's how far can we get? Like, can, can I develop this, you know, well, another thing I'm doing too, is I pitched High Point Universities of building my own learning platform. Mm-hmm. So I've, I've already sold that course. I'm going to be teaching this case studies and business analytics using this software that, I, or platform that I have to develop myself. I had to do that by January. So I basically just, I don't know. You keep adding, I, you keep adding things right, to your list. <laughs> right. So maybe six months from now, I will have completely had a crash and I'm like, right. you know what? I'm in a mini retirement. I'm not doing any work. <laughs> right. Hopefully I'm not going to burn out because it, it, it almost feels like a, a, a car battery that's like charging itself to where like, yeah, there are things that kind of drain my battery, but like we, 
we're doing this really cool thing with uh, the Greensboro College students where we're actually using my data mm-hmm. to and my money to come out with like ad campaigns. So mm-hmm. I, I actually just, I helped, they, they wrote a first iteration of a, a subscribe to our YouTube channel script. We studied the YouTube analytics, the audience tab to pick out, all right, who should we target? Who's the demographic? And we built out like a data-driven buyer persona. So the students actually like got to create that. Um, and I have spent so much time just like cutting that and editing that. And now it just, it was like Christmas morning. We hit the play button on the um, Google ads last night. So today mm-hmm. is the first day that I get to see the results. Right. And we've already seen a huge uptick in, awesome. in subscribers. So it's, I mean, that, that, that's like, I, I literally felt like a little giddy kid being like, <laughs> oh, what's, what, what, what did Santa bring me today? <laughs> right, right. <laughs> yeah, awesome. Um, I want to trans, uh, maybe not, not completely transition topics, but um, go to the kind of this a, a separate question, which is a lot of people don't want to go out there and just start their own business, but they want to kind of dip their toe into the consulting, into freelance work. Um, and there are some websites that you can do that. Two of the most popular being Fiverr and Upwork. I personally have zero experience with these. Um, and I've told people that I'm like, look, that's not my thing. I don't, I don't know about this, but I was hoping maybe you would, uh, since you're kind of more in that domain uh, than I am. Do you have any experience with those um, websites and would you recommend them to people? Um, yes, I do actually have a, a video on my channel about my success case of, I, I have successfully used Upwork to source a client. Mm. So it was a client that was out, I'm in Greensboro, North Carolina. They're out in San Francisco and they do some type of medical um, sales device. So I, I, essentially they, I, I post, I responded to their job posting and said, here's my portfolio. I can take this data and I can build out. It was survey data. And they basically wanted um, basically like a data app where I would pivot the data, put it into a Likert scale. And then we could filter on male, female, what, what position were they in, in the hospital, Mm -hmm. blah, 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 blah. And they could use that to mine, you know, how many 150 survey responses to build out marketing copy. Mm -hmm. So that, that was maybe a year and a half ago. I just had her reach out six months ago, or I guess right before um, COVID hit for another project. Mm -hmm. So I would say absolutely Upwork is a great way to find work. And, and I don't know if this is unfair or inconsiderate, but they do have this new feature. So when I first signed up, anybody and everybody could post, but now there's an option to toggle on US only or everyone in the entire world. Mm -hmm. So I think what happened was back three or four years ago, people from India or maybe some other country were just super underbidding everyone from the the US. And at first the people with looking to get their projects finished, like, oh, we won. But then there was like a, there's time difference. There was probably communication issues. English is a second language. So now there's an option to just bid on or just accept applications from US only. I don't, I don't know if you're specific YouTube demographic. So if, if you guys, sorry, audience, if you don't fall within that, um, it's a little bit tougher on Upwork. But if you do fall in the US, definitely go check that out. That's really interesting. Now, was it very lucrative? Were you earning a lot of money? Would, you know, is that like full-time job money that you were talking about? Or is it just like side hustle, a little bit of money here and there? Oh yeah. It was, it was basically like just a consulting engagement. So we, we agreed to a set price mm-hmm. and then I worked on it for like a week, but I mean, it was very lucrative in that week. You know, I mean, I, I brought in a few thousand dollars off of just a little bit of work. Wow. Um, but what you could do if you wanted to, is you could like really focus um, actually one of our podcast guests on the how to get an English shop <laughs> podcast. I think he is like a superstar status on Upwork and I think he's made over a hundred thousand dollars on it. Wow, that's awesome. And, and is, is that over the course of like a year, two years, three years? Um, you know, I, I can't speak to the specifics on that. This is like a conversation I had like a year ago when he came sure. on the podcast. <laughs> um, but he, I know that, he, I mean, he's, made, he's got like a, he's got a, a whole agency with like subcontract or employees and mm-hmm. they're doing a bunch of work. So that might be a little bit different because his bandwidth 
like he can just say, Hey, I found this new, this new project, you know, Susie go work on this. And then he's just kind of the middleman. But um, I know that if you can get enough projects and what's cool about it is there's the, the rating system. So mm-hmm. if you, if you get a, a project with someone and they leave a good review and a five-star rating, that's going to help you get your next job. Right. So it, it, it kind of comes back to that same concept of like starting your own consulting agency, getting over that first critical mass or that first bump is the hardest part. Mm-hmm. But then once you get there, you actually have, I think, more security mm-hmm. and a higher income. But yeah. it's like, there's, there's kind of that like no man's gap where you are like, should, should I be doing this? Should I just take the safe route? Right. And then, cause, cause I, I, you know, I took a really high risk kind of approaching my career the way I did. I, I could have just, I mean, I guess worst case scenario is that I would have filed bankruptcy and my credit would have been ruined for five years. <laughs> So I, I don't know if that's like a, I don't know if that's like a rich person's mentality. I don't know if I'm like Donald Trump here being like, oh yeah, bankruptcy, fine. That's perfectly normal. Everyone's doing it. <laughs> right. Like, yeah, like I, I've, I'm all in. Oh, right. the, the gamble didn't pay off. Yeah. Awesome. Um, You know, with all the work that you do, you know, it's I, something that I'm really interested in is, you know, are you using the same tools that I'm using? Because I feel like the tools that I'm using are, I'm using a lot of ETL tools, a lot of SQL. Um, you know, I'm starting to get into cloud platforms. Um, you know, we use Tableau, Power BI, those kind of things, those staples. You know, in the consulting era or arena, what tools are you like primarily using? Um, and could you, I guess, give a little bit about how you use those tools for your actual work? Okay. So this is probably going to surprise you because I am not very technically savvy. Like I, I do not believe that <laughs> you make, you, you make YouTube, you have YouTube videos, you create courses, <laughs> you have a podcast. I mean, look, look at your setup, by the way, you, you're better than I am. <laughs> oh, this setup. <laughs> yeah, you're set, I mean, you're glowing. I mean, look at what I got going on. In here. It's, it's, it's night and day. So I feel like you're much more technical savvy than I am. No, well, I don't even know how to code in SQL. I'm, I really? might know how to copy and paste a couple things, but yeah. So like essentially what I do is I, I am stronger on the sales side, less so on the technical acumen side. Okay. So if I do need to like bring in a data scientist, I can subcontract that work. Right. So like, for example, um, I, I've, I've got a new client proposal on the, on my desk right now where the client is working with some CRM. So customer relationship management tool, and we need to automate that. So I'm just going to subcontract that out. So, right. I mean, I, I can, I, my strong suit is that I can close deals and then I can, you know, I actually had this conversation with my students yesterday about, like, we were talking about a, a case study and the, one of the, ma- one of the students is a math major and just took this to kind of like round out their, their senior year. Um, and he went like super into like the mathematics. He was like, we were, we were looking at total sales and deal size across industry. And he was like, well, we, if we did this calculation, blah, 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 blah. And, and I was like, look, a CEO is not going to care what, like about your math. They're going, they're going on. Basically what I tell people, if I'm being a little cutesy here is um, I make picture books for very influential adults. (laughs) Like this box is bigger than this box. Uh So we should do this. I mean, it's like, and and the thing is like, it's um, I'm watching this, this show designated survivor. And it's like, I think I'm pretty good at the political game. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, like um, he, he was he was like talking about this response in a press meeting or something. And the and the um, the head of press or whatever was like, look, you're going into your professor tone. Just give them very basic, simple answers. And then that that's how you handle that. And then so there is a caveat to that in that if I'm telling a CEO or CMO, like this is the recommendation I have or here's the analysis. Mm-hmm. And they're like, well, this doesn't look quite right then you go in and you show them the math or you go in and right. show them the data. So I totally am not answering your questions. The tools that I use are Excel and Tableau. <laughs> also Power BI too. <laughs> okay, okay. So, well, you know, what you said is super interesting though. I mean, it's more decision maker stuff um, mm-hmm. rather than the t- super technical getting in, 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 you know, consulting, you know, it is a business. You have to have that business side. Whereas right. I don't need to have that business side as much. So I get much more into the technicals um, rather than the business aspect that you have to right. do in order to be successful. Um, mm-hmm. So you mentioned Excel, Tableau, Power BI. So you're more right. on the visual the visual side of things. Yeah, um, so when I first started 
at like the first six months after my MBA, I branded myself as a data visualization specialist. Sure. Then I realized that's too narrow. And now I kind of brand myself as an analytics expert, sure. which is um, a little, little vague and a little questionable, maybe. <laughs> expert. <laughs> I don't know how to code. <laughs> right. a- a- expert can mean a lot of things. <laughs> right. Yeah. That, I mean, but um, I think a lot of people are really interested in that because I think m- I would say a lot of people have the misconception that a data analyst does a lot of visualizations, which we, which we do. I'm not saying we don't, but it's a lot heavier on the technical side of cleaning the data, ETL stuff to get the data in, getting it set up for the visualizations. And then the visualizations are maybe 10, 15, sometimes 20% of your job. It sounds like yours is a lot more when you're actually doing technical stuff instead of the business side, it's a lot heavier on the visualization side of things. Right, exactly. Yeah. So essentially what I do is I build interactive dashboards. And so I'm working with companies 150 million or less. So mm-hmm. they're, they're not they're not huge companies where there's kind of like legacy systems and there's like this whole nested, right. like, you know, you, you had the original system and this was tacked on and this was, and these don't communicate. Right. You've got to have like None of those problems. architect. Yeah, I don't have that. It's like, oh, um, we want to look at our Google Analytics data, which is pretty much collected perfectly unless they didn't set up one of the tracking things. Right. Which, you know, I, and that's definitely a critique I've had on my courses is that I don't have enough dirty data that I should, I, I'm a little off base with data analysts to where I guess I kind of, I, I kind of see myself as a business analyst, but really what you could see me as, as a management consultant with a little bit of technical analytics acumen. Yeah, I could totally see that because, you know, I work with the messiest data you've ever seen in your life. And a lot of my job is cleaning that up and doing mm-hmm. a lot of that work where, you know, you're getting clean data and I'm extremely jealous because <laughs> that sounds like a dream come true. Um, right. It, but, but you get to use that data to make impactful business decisions for a company. Um, yeah. It yeah. really is. It, I wouldn't say, I would not say that what you're doing is like data analyst. It definitely is analytics. Right. But mm-hmm. so, you know, there it's, it's just a different path of the analytics. You can go the more technical route or the little bit more business side of things, um, right. which, you know, you got to keep your options open. Maybe you want to do both uh, and, and find some niche in there uh, that to really capitalize on. But, you know, it's not just if I'm a data analyst, I could go and do what you do, you know. Yeah. So I think that's like coming back to the, do I regret my MBA or not? I did learn a lot about business from kind of the corporate jargon perspective. Although you could argue like, I, this is like my third or fourth business. Like I, I, I know new business, uh-huh. you know, like, like these, these like huge companies, like they don't understand YouTube. What's fascinating to me is that I have made my niche off the failures of Tableau and Power BI to market on YouTube. Mm -hmm. So the way that my channel is blown up is that two years ago, Tableau put out a new desktop specialist certification. I simply made a review of that certification, my experience passing it. And then that blew up, got picked up by search algorithm, the search algorithm. And now I've made a bunch of videos on that. And now I've capitalized on this kind of, I don't know, what do you call that? Like digital real estate. Sure. So now I'm making money off of explaining. I've done the same concept with, um, Power BI just came out with the exam DA 100. So I've done the same concept only this time I've executed a whole lot more effectively on it. Right. You, you, you've learned how to play the system a little bit better. You're a little bit more prepared. And so right. this time around, just, you're doing a little bit better. Yeah. I'm a, I'm a little bit more effective at leeching. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. That's a good way to put it. <laughs> no, I mean, I, I, it's wide open. I, I don't think it's like an unethical or predatory in any way. It's just yeah. fascinating to me that these big companies have these bill, like, I don't know, million dollar budgets and they're not putting content on, on YouTube. Although yeah. maybe it's just a shifting marketplace in that people on YouTube want to hear from, you know, you or right. I who are, this is my experience. So right. real people, I think, I that's mean, fascinating. you know, Databricks right. and um, Tableau and some, they do have their own YouTube channels and I've watched their videos. Uh, they're, they're not um, very personal. They're very Corporate, much, yeah. um, they're m- very much, here's what a dashboard is. And it's very boring. <laughs> I've watched right. them and I hated it. I went and took a Udemy course because I like hearing someone talk of like, like a real person um, right. and, and kind of have that personal touch. That's just, uh, 
that's just me. Um, so uh, another something else, uh, you know, that you kind of touched on was, you know, courses and trainings and and all of these things that you know that you're able to capitalize and make and make money off of. I would love to um, hear a little bit of more about your trainings. You know, what you teach in them, um, as well as where do you think the best places to learn are, especially for people who are just starting out? You know, is it Udemy, Coursera, FX, Udacity? There's just so many options. Mm -hmm. I would say, hmm, I think LinkedIn learning is probably, if you're brand new, Mm -hmm. because LinkedIn does two things. Well, actually it does a lot of things. So I've got five courses on LinkedIn and they actually, they flew me out. This is an, an awesome story. Maybe I've told you this, so. I'm sorry if I bored you, but the audience. No, I'm, I'm interested. I'm here. <laughs> uh, they so I, I there's a startup called Madecraft that's from one of the former um, marketing, I guess higher ups for Linda because Linda got bought by LinkedIn, mm-hmm. so they're kind of the same platform. He started a s- startup. Boy, that's redundant. He founded a startup sure. <laughs> that um, does content creation. So I got flown out to Santa Barbara to record in their studio. So mm-hmm. those five courses. And what was amazing to me is that my product manager or like my production manager had worked with like Oprah Winfrey and like some of these big name brand people. Mm-hmm. And I was, I was pretty shocked at the, the, the like the quality of the content. Right. So like they're sitting down with you to script, script this out. And I think what LinkedIn does, which is I think the future of education is it's entertaining and it's educational and it's banned at the same time. There's also a secondary benefit that I think is hugely valuable is that when you pass one of the LinkedIn learning courses, that badge goes on your page right. and it's backed by LinkedIn. Right. So I think that it hits like, not only are you learning skills, but you're also broadcasting. Right. Absolutely. Missing. Those are the bane of my existence. I got to be honest though, because I've taken like, I've taken some of these and I'm like, I know this skill. I use this in my job. Why can't I pass this course? <laughs> or why can't I pass this badge? Uh, and, and that's just my personal experience. Don't get Wait, that. what do you, what do you mean? So I think we're talking about two different things. So when you just like watch the lectures, right. they give you a badge. There's no, oh, there's see, no see, we're talking about something different. Cause there, there right. are skill badges that you can go on your profile, go to the bottom. Mm-hmm. You have like, I, I can advertise that I know T SQL and then okay. I can go and I can take like this mini test. And then it gives me a badge on my profile as well. Oh, so maybe, yeah, I have, we're talking I have about two different things. I haven't though. done any of them, but yeah. I, I would say that from like an economic signaling theory perspective, those, those tests signal much stronger than just, oh, well, you could have just like hit play and then gone off to the kitchen and cooked and then, right. oh, I'm done with my LinkedIn learning, time to put right. it on. But I, I do think like the way that I've structured my Greensboro College case studies and business analytics course um, this month, I think that these badges are kind of a good way to fill the gaps. Sure. So I have two courses on Power BI and then also an uh, analytics introduction. So within the first month, they took those, got those badges. Then what we're doing is we're also having the student practicum and then a Tableau portfolio. So mm-hmm. you can show that you actually know how to use Tableau. You've applied it to a real use case. Tab- uh, Power BI doesn't really have a great public server or a public way to, to broadcast what you've done or build out like free dashboards. That's where I think those badges can kind of show that Oh, well, you, you know, data visualization and you know it across two different platforms. Wow. That's awesome. You know, for everyone watching, um, I'm going to put the links to his courses and his channel and everything in the description. So everything Aww. that he's talking about, that's going to be down below if you want to check that out. I personally have not used a ton of LinkedIn learning. I use mostly Udemy and Coursera. And I have so many people ask me, what do I think of LinkedIn learning? And I'm like, I'm like, to be honest, I just don't have much experience in it. So for those people who are curious, you know, check out his videos because I'm sure, you know, they're going to be really good. And I had no idea that they flew you out to make those videos. Where, how do I get on this train? Where do I go? Where do I sign up? Because I'm, I'm trying to fly out somewhere. So uh, I think what you should probably get in the course creation game. I got it. I have to. I need to. I, yeah. We talked about this like six months to a year ago. We have. And I, and I, I don't see any results. I'm all I'm, 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 <laughs> I'm saying that with love as your friend, and I'm, I'm holding you accountable. <laughs> wait, wait, we're, we're give me, course. give me one more year, and then I'll get okay. to it. <laughs> okay, sounds very suspiciously similar to what I heard a year ago. But, I'll say that next year right. too. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I mean, honestly, though, LinkedIn Learning is a really interesting platform. I mm-hmm. do recommend people just check it out. 
because that is where I am inexperienced in. And I am always telling people, if I don't know it, go check it out yourself um, because it might be perfect for you. Um, Is there any other skills that you find that LinkedIn learning is really good at? Because so far I've heard mostly Tableau, Power BI. Was there anything else data analytics related that you thought was good on that platform as well? Well, I know they have like a whole data science library. Oh, interesting. So I can't speak to, actually, I can speak to one of um, my podcast guests, Michael Galarnik, mm-hmm. is a fantastic data scientist. Like he, well, he's also got a blog that's getting like 150,000 views a month. Oh, wow. And he's getting more offers for consulting work than he could ever take on. Sure. But I know that um, he recorded through Madecraft and ha- is published up there. He also teaches online at Stanford. So mm-hmm. I, so if you want to learn kind of, I think he's getting into Python and some more like advanced data science stuff, right. but I know that he is, he's, he's really sharp. So maybe yeah. go check out some Michael Galernick's courses. Okay. I'll put those courses below as well. I'm going to find them. I'll put All them right. below. <laughs> I have no idea. I've never seen these in my life, but it's, it's worth checking out. If people are interested right. in, in checking that out, I want them to have the resources to find that. So uh, that'll be in the description as well. Um, I, I mean, I am so thankful that you got to come today. I've learned so much. Honestly, I just did not know much about the consulting world, you know, the the business aspect of things. That is just, is nothing I've ever looked into. And so, you know, if people aren't learning anything, I I surely learned a ton. (laughs) And so I am so thankful for you coming on here. I really, really do appreciate it. Awesome. Well, thanks. Thanks for having me on. I mean, I think that uh, this is a great opportunity. I appreciate it. I know you've been, you've been killing it with the interviews lately. I mean, you just, it's, it's, it's channel after channel after channel. You just, you're so popular these days. It's hard to get a hold of you. I know. I don't feel like I have, I need a PR person, you know, <laughs> like someone set these meetings for me. Yeah. Why am I doing other work? Yeah. Um, that's, that's, have next, that's your next level. That's, that's, that's where true. you got to take yeah. it. <laughs> awesome. Uh, well, thank you guys so much. Um, before you go, Something that we do at the end of every Alex the Analyst show is I give them a keyword in order for them to type in the, uh, in, in the discussion below just to show that they watched to the very end. Uh, and, and, and so far, I have it has been highly vegetable-based. So we've done things like uh, my wife chose carrots when she was on last week. We've done eggplant. We've done, oh gosh, uh, uh, jalapenos jalapenos is there what and i'm just i'm leaving this one up to you but if it repeats i'll, I'll let you know is what vegetable and it doesn't have to be for any reason at all it'd be just completely random what okay. would you I've say they need to type in the chat below so that they prove that they made it to the end they're they're dedicated they're going to be successful all of those things asparagus i don't know how to spell that us hey they gotta google it man That's don't true. don't don't give it to them we don't we don't <laughs> You know, this is a, this is a tough, a tough game we're playing here. That's true. Yeah. That, that, that one just came to mind. So All right. type in asparagus. There you go. <laughs> All right. But for real type in asparagus below, because it, I know <laughs> that when I, cause I, and, I, and there inevitably are tons of people who, who watch all the way through because they find value in the content and, and they like, um, you know, listening and learning. And so for those people, I always know who they are. And there's a very specific person who always finishes. And so I look forward to seeing those uh, uh, in, the, in the discussion in the chat below. Um, with that being said, I mean, th- that's it. Thank you for, for everything. You've been awesome. Um, I look forward to seeing your channel grow and, and continue seeing your, the awesome content that you're putting out. Yeah, thank you. The, uh, you're always fun to talk to. I, I appreciate you having me on. Yeah, thank you so much. All right. Well, thank you everybody for joining today. Uh, if you haven't already, be sure to like and subscribe. Go check out John's channel as well. And I will see you in the next show. And goodbye.